I thought that what we would do to, uh, for a little bit today would just entertain some questions. Um, if you have any question about absolutely anything regarding the Christian faith, I'd just like to see where maybe, maybe you are. Um, now, when you ask a question, make sure it is a question and not a proclamation of all that you know. Um, also, I hope that the questions are a bit varied, and that is that uh, um, we hear from different aspects of the Christian life, because the Christian life, foundationally, it is um, doctrine, it is theology, but it does not end with theology or doctrine. There is also what we know as doxology and praxis. Doxology refers to worship and practice. Pra praxis refers to the practice of the Christian faith. And all sound theology is going to lead to an adequate lifestyle, a biblical lifestyle, and biblical worship in our lives. So, does anyone have a question? Yes. This is related. Um, it seems like sometimes in uh, the circles that we tend to run in, I guess, that um, there doesn't seem to be as much life in worship as there would be, or as there is in some other circles, that maybe the basis of that, of that life is not um, always correct, but there seems to be, um, you know, in the midst of, you know, solid theology, it doesn't translate to the, to the life and um, the, the spirit. Uh, I don't know how to explain it, but do uh, you understand what I'm mm -hmm. asking? How, how, how could that better translate from solid doctrine to um, being lived out in worship um, and actually seeing uh, emotion and joy and excitement and One, uh, how does worship then uh, become a more active, vibrant part of our daily life, or every aspect of life? As it seems like our theology, we're always talking about theology, we're always talking about living right. Worship seems to take more of a back seat. Um, worship also seems to be a bit confined. And what I mean by that is not just a lack of emotion in worship, but it's confined to one part of our life. First of all, um, this is what I've discovered. In any doctrine, um, for example, if I'm going to teach on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, if I teach on the gifts of the Holy Spirit one Sunday, I'm talking about when I was a pastor, um, it really did not have that great of an impact. Even if there was something of the help of the Holy Spirit and uh, God seemed to be there uh, illuminating minds and hearts, it still did not have that great of an impact. And I realized that if I was going to teach on the Holy Spirit, I needed to teach on the Holy Spirit for four months. Uh, it's the same way in, in worship. You have to ask yourself, well, how much is being taught on worship? Actually, very little a lot of times in our, our circles that we run in. There's not a whole lot taught on worship. And so, when you're, it's not put before you, and your mind is not constantly being renewed with regard to worship, you kind of put it on the back burner. Let's just face it. That's why we have stick-up notes and everything on our refrigerators. Because we know that our life is regulated by what we're reminded to do. And if, not, if, if, if we're not making much of worship, then worship will not be much in our life. Secondly, when you confine worship to a corporate setting and, and do not promote it individually and um, in... unplanned meetings of Christians. What I mean by that is 
when two or three brothers get together to pray or go over someone's house and have a meal, how often do they worship? They may pray together. They may sit around the Word and talk about the Word, but how often do they worship together? You see, so we confine it to one setting, a corporate setting on a certain day. And it does not permeate the rest of our life. And yet, it may be argued, it may be argued that um, doxology is the end of all things. It is the goal to which everything else is, is moving. Not just correct doctrine, but also praxis. I mean, in heaven, I doubt very seriously whether we'll be preaching. Now, I don't know that for sure. But I know we will be worshiping. And so I, I think it comes back to um, what, is, what is the emphasis laid before uh, the believer as an individual and the emphasis laid before the believer corporately. Right, um, it, it can have something to do with the way you define worship. For, exact, for example, every act of obedience um, should be an act of worship. Every, every drinking of a glass of water should be. But um, it, it's, it's something like practicing the presence of God. Uh, a little book that was written many, many years ago, a guy named of Brother Lawrence, um, there's a lot in there that's, that's good. Not all, but there's a lot in there that's very good. And people will a lot of times tell me, they go, well, I don't have a specific time of praying. I just pray all the time. And I doubt very seriously whether that's true. Uh, because I have learned that you learn to practice the presence of God and to walk in a constant communion with Him by means of meeting with Him daily. And, and structurally, I mean, where you have a time where you sit down and you pray. I think it's the same with worship. I find it very difficult for someone who tells me, you know, well, I just worship God in everything I do, if they do not have spe specific times of worship. Even in the, the family, so-called family altar, or family devotions, it appears, of, the, um, of our forefathers, that worship, the singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, played a great deal, had a great emphasis, or was given a great emphasis in their daily devotions. Um, I think one thing that can be very, very helpful is to obtain a small, um, well-put-together uh, hymn book that can be carried with you and carry it with you as you carry your Bible. And it, acts as a, it can act as a reminder that uh, you are to be involved in worship. Uh, several years ago in Peru, I was noticing a, a group of us would meet together a couple of times a week and we would pray. And I was noticing that there was... I mean, all the men, it was during all the civil unrest, it was a time of great strife and trial, which, ought to, which always creates spirituality. Uh, the men I was praying with were, were wanting God, were wanting uh, to see a great deal of uh, souls saved and, and so on and so forth, but there seemed to be so little power in our praying. And one of the brothers, by the name of Ethiel, was a wonderful, wonderful um, musician and um, wrote songs and for the Lord that were very, very beautiful. And uh, I asked him, I said, Ethiel, I said, why don't next week when we start praying again, why don't you just bring your guitar? Let's start out in worship. And it just really transformed everything. It just really did. Um, a lot of people say, well, you need to get right with God first in prayer and deal with your sins and all sorts of things and then come to Him in worship. And there's a sense in which that's true, but I have found that worshiping God and being in the presence of God is what brings about um, a revelation of my sin and my need. And so I think worship is probably greatly overlooked. 
Now, but, but let me say this. There are some denominations or uh, movements uh, that put a great deal of emphasis on worship, but they don't have any doctrine. Or uh, they'll put a great emphasis on worship, but they're worshiping um, a God that they don't really know. Or they're worshiping a God that they've created in their own mind. So we need that balance. We need to be both theologically sound and given over to worship. Another question or comment? Uh, you had one, Ken? 